Baldur's Gate 3 is true to its Dungeons & Dragons roots as it's filled to the brim with combat. Sure, you can talk your way out of some situations, but the dice god hangs over every conversation and you're always one bad roll away from insulting the Ogre Chief's vinyl record collection and getting ground into dust by his crew. There are also many situations where peace isn't an option and you have to fight your way out, so don't try and go for any pacifist builds in this game. Let's try to be diplomatic, shall we? Ah! I hope that was worth it, Diddy! As Baldur's Gate 3 uses 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons rules, the game does its best to explain how it translates to the tabletop combat mechanics, but it can be very overwhelming at first, especially as the tutorial isn't perfect and even the balanced difficulty can be brutal at times. Luckily, we're here to explain the basics of combat in Baldur's Gate 3 and all of the advanced tricks you can use to kill monsters and take their stuff. The action economy is the key to victory. When a battle starts in Baldur's Gate 3, you'll see a little 20-sided dice roll above each participant's head. This is called the initiative roll and it determines the order everyone goes in. This can be different each time, so if you're save scumming, don't expect to see the same turn order. If a character has a high dexterity score or the alert feat, then they'll get a bonus to their initiative roll, but they can still roll low and end up going last. When it's a character's turn, they can do four things. Move, perform an action, perform a bonus action, and use reaction. That last one is something that usually happens on an enemy's turn and in response to something they do. If you can use reaction ability, then the game will pause and bring up a prompt and tell you what your options are. So it's something that will happen automatically so you don't need to worry about it. Movement is used to, well, move your character around the battlefield. When it comes to movement, your character's remaining speed is shown in a bar at the top of the UI. This will let you plan out your strategy for the round as you can move, then perform actions, and then move again. You also have the ability to jump, which takes up a chunk of your movement speed, but is really useful for avoiding hazards. Once your movement is spent, you're grounded until your next turn. You can take an action and a bonus action on your turn. If you're unsure which is used, select the ability or spell and its action type will be displayed on the bottom of its description. In most cases, an action is something like performing an attack, casting a spell, or using a class's special ability, while smaller moves like drinking a potion or shoving an enemy require a bonus action. Knowing what kinds of actions your abilities can use is the key to victory, as the enemy uses the same action economy that you do, so they can also throw out several moves during their turn. Try to work out different combos that you can use on your turn. Some of the most common tactics include spells that have a bonus action casting time like Healing Word or Hex, and using them in the same turn as your action. If you can, always make sure to use both your action and bonus action in your turn, because even the minor moves like shoving, dipping your weapon in poison, or restoring some health via a potion can pay off down the road. Don't forget that healing potions also take a bonus action to use. These will help keep your team alive, especially when your cleric or druid is taken down, so make sure to have an even spread of healing juice spread across your party. Moving around the battlefield and using opportunity attacks. The position of every participant in a battle is vitally important in Baldur's Gate 3. This isn't like the retro Final Fantasy games where everyone stands in a neat little row and waves swords at each other. The fights in Baldur's Gate 3 can get chaotic, as the battlefield grows more crowded and dangerous over time. If you need a bit of an extra boost to your movement speed, you can take the dash action to move twice during your turn. This is especially useful for when you're trying to evade enemies or if you want to catch up to archers or spellcasters that are far away. One key thing to note about moving around the battlefield is a Dungeons & Dragons rule called Opportunity Attacks, which is very much a part of Baldur's Gate 3. To put it simply, if you move into an enemy's melee range and then try to move out of it, they will get a free melee attack against you, which costs their reaction for the turn. You're free to move around the enemy so long as you never leave its melee range. Bear in mind that your characters can also perform opportunity attacks, which can be used for some free damage if the enemy runs around too much. Knowing about opportunity attacks is important when there are a lot of enemies on the field as they tend to swarm around one character. Let's say your wizard gets surrounded by four enemy goblins and you try to run away. Boom! Four opportunity attacks at once, enough to potentially take you down and on your own turn no less. Bear in mind that this only applies to running away using your standard movement speed. If you have a teleportation spell such as Misty Step or Dimension Door, then you can Nightcrawler your way to safety without being hit. You also have an option called Disengage, which every character in the game can use. If you disengage, then you don't prompt opportunity attacks when running away. Think of it as if you're being extra vigilant when fleeing like a coward. Using Disengage does have a cost, however, as it takes up your action for the turn. A common tactic to use when a character is taking a shellacking in melee combat is to disengage, run away, and then chug a healing potion, hoping that the next round will be kinder to you. Luckily, rogues don't have this problem, as when they hit level 2, they gain a feature called Cunning Action. This lets them perform a dash or disengage by spending a bonus action instead of action. Rogues are the masters of running around the battlefield, so you should use cunning action as much as possible to put yourself in advantageous positions. Come on, you lot. No point in getting killed. Baldur's Gate 3's three resources and when you should use them. 
Your party members can use their melee and ranged weapons to their heart's content, but the truly powerful attacks you have access to are finite. These are your character features, spells, and items. A lot of character features, such as the Barbarian's Rage ability or the Dragonborn's Breath attack, usually can be used once or twice a day. These powers are among your strongest, and they should be saved for tougher fights and boss battles. If a fight isn't going your way, then don't be afraid to throw them out, as they won't be much use to you dead. But if you can, use your other options first. The second option is magic, and this comes in two varieties, cantrips and spells. Cantrips have unlimited uses and will be the main weapons used by spellcasters. This is because the offensive cantrips, like Firebolt and Ray of Frost, use your spellcasting modifier bonus when hitting an enemy, which means they are more likely to hit than if they were using a bow or a sword. Don't be afraid to spam your cantrips both in and out of combat, as that's what they're there for. Your spells are a bit more limited, as they're tied to spell slots that are expended when used and aren't restored until you rest. The spells used by your casters will be among the strongest options you possess, so don't be afraid to whip them out in combat. As your characters level up, they'll get more spell slots, so you won't have to worry as much about burning resources as you progress through the game. Just be a bit more careful during the early hours of Baldur's Gate 3, and only bring out the big guns when you need them. Finally, we have magic items. In 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, magic items are rare and powerful, with most parties only ever discovering a handful of them. It seems that Larian Studios didn't get this memo, as Baldur's Gate 3 is filled with magic items that you'll find in dungeons or being sold by every vendor. The most common magic items include spell scrolls, which can be used once to cast their listed spell, magic arrows that have to be used manually and have special properties, usually involving AoE damage or creating a special surface on the ground, grenades which do what you think they do, and potions which give the user a buff that usually lasts until the end of the battle or when the player rests. Magic items are everywhere in Baldur's Gate 3, so don't be afraid to stock up on them when you go to the merchant and use them liberally in combat. If using an item can give you an advantage that will prevent you from using your class features or spells, then go for it, as you're saving the big resources for when they can be used later. Baldur's Gate 3 isn't the kind of game that rewards hoarding, so ignore all of your gaming instincts and don't be afraid to empty your inventory onto your enemies. Examining the enemy and exploiting weaknesses Baldur's Gate 3 is similar to Pokemon, as enemies have tight weaknesses and resistances. There are three types of weapon damage and ten kinds of elemental damage. The weapon damage types are bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing, while the elemental damage types are acid, cold, fire, force, lightning, necrotic, poison, psychic, radiant, and thunder. If you check the description of your items and spells, it will tell you what damage type they use. You should become familiar with exactly what damage type your attacks use, because some of your power's names can be deceiving. A great example is the Sacred Flame Cantrip, which sounds like it deals fire damage, but it actually does radiant damage because it's holy fire, which is legally distinct from actual fire. So why do you need to know these damage types? Because Baldur's Gate lets you cheat, as you can learn every enemy's strengths and weaknesses by examining them. That's correct, select an enemy, bring up the context menu, and hit the examine command to view their stats, special moves, and most importantly, what hits them hardest. In Baldur's Gate 3, there are three types of damage modifiers, resistance, immunities, and weakness. If an enemy resists a damage type, that means it will take half the damage if it's used against them, but if it's weak to the damage, it will take double. Meanwhile, if an enemy is immune to the damage, then it takes no damage if it's hit by that type of attack. Examining an enemy, especially the boss monsters, is vitally important in Baldur's Gate 3. Not only will it tell you what kind of nonsense special abilities they'll use, but you'll be informed about exactly what works and what doesn't work against them. This means you won't be wasting turns using attacks that they're immune to, and if you die, you'll know what spells and magic items you'll need to bring when you come back for round two. Things you can do that the game doesn't explain. Here's some quick fire points that will help you in Baldur's Gate 3. Rogues have a powerful move called Sneak Attack, which deals extra damage if you hit an enemy that you have advantage against or if an ally is within their melee range. Unfortunately, you need to manually select the melee sneak attack or the ranged sneak attack option, as the game won't do it automatically. If you notice that your rogue isn't doing much damage, this could be the reason why. Darling, I thought you'd never ask. If you're playing a warlock or using will, then the hex spell is your best friend as it's a warlock exclusive spell that puts a curse on an enemy, which adds extra damage when you strike them with a spell. The thing about the hex spell is that it's not a one-shot deal. If you kill an enemy with a hex, you can move it to another enemy by spending your bonus action. This means you can keep pushing hex onto new foes and combine it with the Eldritch Blast cantrip to deal a ton of extra damage across an entire battle. This next tip might be a glitch, but we hope Larian keeps it in. It's usually only possible to chug a healing potion yourself, but in Baldur's Gate 3, you can use them like they're a healing grenade. To do this, go into your inventory, bring up the potion's context menu, select throw, and aim it at your ally's feet. Make sure not to throw it at them as they'll take damage. If your ally is in the potion's AoE, then they'll be healed. This is a great tactic for when your healer goes down and you're running out of options for bringing them back. If an ally gets dropped to zero hit points in combat, they'll be incapacitated and knocked to the ground. 
Usually the best way to aid them is by healing them with a spell or potion grenade, but there is a way to do it for free. Simply move another party member next to the downed ally and select them. This will bring up the help command which costs an action, but your wounded ally will now be back on their feet and ready to chug a potion on their next turn. One trick that has been around since the days of Baldur's Gate 3's early access period involves turning the humble candle into an engine of destruction. This is because all characters have a move called Dip, which takes a bonus action to use unless you add an elemental property to your weapon based on a surface you're standing on. So, want to add some fire to your arrows? Just pick up one of the countless candles you find in the overworld, drop it at the start of combat, then use Dip. Now all of your arrows will be dealing fire damage for free. With all this information in mind, you're now free to go out and conquer the world of Baldur's Gate 3. Just remember that this game is teeming with options to use in combat, so don't ever feel like you're in a hopeless situation. A big part of what makes this game enjoyable is seeing the Dungeons & Dragons rules stretch to fit over a video game and being able to unleash the kinds of chaos on your enemy that most Dungeon Masters wouldn't allow. Luckily, Larian Studios is the most generous Dungeon Master around, so feel free to bend and break the rules to your heart's content.